Good afternoon to all the students who are uh, joining online. This is Professor David from IIT Madras. This is an interactive Q&A session on the uh, topics pertaining to the wireless and uh, in, in wireless and cellular communications. So currently, we are in week six. And you would have been looking or uh, listening to lectures which talk about the uh, Whiteson stationary uncorrelated scattering model. That would be a, a very useful tool for us to understand and characterize and also work with wireless channels. So the two uh, important elements that we have are the time dispersion. That is one aspect of the wireless channel, which is captured in the wireless uh, white sense stationary uncorrelated scattering model. And the other one is the time variation. The time variation and the time dispersion. Both are the key elements, and that is what uh, we have been looking at in today's uh, today's uh, in this week's lectures. And uh, we have also been looking at uh, how to model it. How does it characterize the uh, wireless channel? Which, when you have this type of variation, and uh, therefore uh, ability uh, enables us to understand and work with wireless channels in a very effective manner. So uh, this is an uh, opportunity uh, that uh, you have to ask uh, questions on uh, any of the lectures that you have observed or uh, questions that may be uh, pertaining to wireless, but maybe not necessarily covered in the course. Uh, I'll be happy to uh, answer them or provide you references to, so that you can, you can then uh, read up about these, uh, these topics. I hope you are able to see the screen in which uh, we will be uh, writing. So uh, if there are any, uh, any uh, difficulties, uh, please do send a message on the live chat. I'll begin by answering the two questions that were uh, submitted by students online. And uh, please feel free to uh, submit any additional questions. And uh, we'll be happy to uh, take them up and answer them. The first uh, question that was submitted online uh, is from Carolyn. And the question is, uh, it is hard to visualize wireless process pragmatically. MATLAB or any simulation would be helpful. Uh, I fully agree with it. It's a very correct statement. Uh, in order for us to visualize what is happening with the wireless uh, in a wireless channel, uh, MATLAB simulations are extremely helpful. And uh, we do plan to have uh, MATLAB simulations for, uh, for as part of the course. Uh, we are in the process of uh, addressing the MATLAB license issue. Uh, as soon as the uh, uh, license issue is resolved, we will be uh, posting a, a note on the uh, on the course website and also uh, releasing some uh, simple MATLAB assignments. So once uh, you see that uh, um, note on MATLAB, uh, that means uh, you can access MATLAB through the NPTEL uh, course, and uh, you'll be able to then uh, attempt the MATLAB assignments. So MATLAB. A very useful tool uh, for us to visualize and to understand what happens in a wireless channel. So here are some of the things that uh, that we can do in MATLAB. In MATLAB, we can generate and look at what the transmitted signal looks like. Okay, we have an IQ modulator, which has uh, which has pulse shaping, and we can look at what the effect of the IQ uh, of the pulse shaping and the IQ modulator uh, together. So basically, we can look at the what the transmitted signal looks like. Then the second one is uh, we can apply the different channel impairments. Channel impairments, and as we have been discussing in this week's lecture, the uh, there are several that we would uh, like to un uh, understand. First one, of course, is fading. This is the time variation of the envelope of the received signal. This is, this is what is affected by the uh, presence of motion, and the rate of change is affected uh, by captured by means of the Doppler. This can be very nicely simulated in a MATLAB environment. The second one that we can uh, we can inter we can uh, we can simulate is that of time dispersion. Time dispersion. Okay. Uh, 
uh, time dispersion. And this is what we refer to as the frequency selectivity of the channel. Because of the time dispersion, there is a channel gain that depends on the frequency. So if they can think of this as the frequency, this as the gain of the channel, and you could have a response where the frequency response is not constant. So some frequencies, for example, you would have some frequencies which have lower gain compared to other frequencies which could uh, exhibit a, a larger gain. So this is the uh, effect of time dispersion. You get a frequency selective, uh, frequency selective fading, uh, frequency selective uh, response. So basically, uh, frequency selective channels. This is something that we can uh, simulate. The uh, third one that we can simulate is the uh, so the time dispersion will give us intersymbol interference, and uh, the, the third one that we can uh, simulate in a uh, MATLAB type environment is the presence of interference. And this could be primarily uh, co-channel interference. Somebody else, some other user who is using the same channel. And therefore, with these three uh, sets of impairments, we, we can more or less capture the, uh, the complete uh, wireless communication uh, channels. And so uh, then, the, of course, the last uh, the part, or the most important part that we can simulate in MATLAB would be the receiver. So the receiver would be one where uh, you would look at the different addressing the different impairments. So different types of compensation techniques, compensation for the uh, the channel impairments. Uh, the most important one would be different types of synchronization. Synchronization uh, synchronization can be in time synchronization frequency synchronization. Ideally, we would like to have no frequency offsets between the transmitter and receiver. Uh, and therefore, we can get a, a very good coherent receiver. So synchronization in frequency and also in time uh, is, is an important one. Then uh, we look at whether equalizer is needed or not. Equalizer is needed. And if an equalizer is needed, we would also have channel estimation. An equalizer will require you to implement a coherent receiver. And therefore, you must have a channel estimation algorithm. Channel estimation algorithm. So uh, basically, synchronization, equalization, and then uh, finally, you would have a decision stage. And the decision stage can uh, either give out hard decisions. That means you make a decision whether a particular bit is a 0 or a 1, or you could provide soft output. So that uh, uh, the, uh, the if there's a, a channel decoder after the uh, detection, after the receiver, um, after the demodulation, then we could use that as well. So a MATLAB could do all of these things. We will try to uh, at least uh, uh, introduce uh, examples where you could look at one or more of these uh, channel impairments. And of course, MATLAB can also give us the ability to simulate and verify analytically. Simulate and verify the uh, BER performance. Uh, performance. And so that, that is uh, an, another uh, very useful uh, reason why we would work with uh, BER performance. OK, so those are uh, some very useful uh, ways in which we could use MATLAB. And uh, uh, what you have mentioned is a, is a very good point. We will definitely try to expose you uh, to expose all the students to some MATLAB exercises so that you could then get become more comfortable. Now, uh, I think there's a second part to Carolyn's question. You have said that it will be pleased if you could uh, show on air, that is in one of these interactive sessions, uh, MATLAB simulated real-time example. So what we would, uh, what we will maybe try to do uh, for, for you next time uh, would be to look at what does the uh, transmitted signal look like. Uh, we could do some pulse shaping and then show you that. We can also look at what happens when uh, noise is added to the uh, signal, what happens to the constellation. I think we may have drawn this figure last time. Basically, we transmit a QPSK constellation, four points. When noise gets added, you will find that there is uh, 
the 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 boundaries of the uh, constellation are no longer just uh, points but they are actually uh, uh, they are uh, they are corrupted by noise so this uh, uncertainty region of uncertainty is because of the noise so this is this is due to noise and we can show you some examples of this as well so we will definitely uh, show you some slides that uh, would be uh, would be instructive. And if there are uh, any other questions that you have related to this, please do uh, let us know. We'll try to accommodate them. Okay, so we move on to question two. Question two is from Ram Prasad. The question is uh, about uh, one of the fundamental aspects of uh, wireless communication. So we use the word wireless as a synonym for the electromagnetic electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation okay now here is what i would uh, i would like to uh, point out the electromagnetic spectrum uh, is a very vast spectrum so uh, what we uh, what we can see is that uh, th there are uh, uh, portions where of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, where if you look at the uh, the, the uh, transmissions uh, they could be in the optical domain so which means that uh, yes it is electromagnetic but it is in the optical domain maybe uh, free space optical or uh, fiber optic so i would say that it is not uh, necessarily true that we can use these words synonymously there is a range in the electromagnetic radiation where it lends itself to be able to radiate to be radiated by means of a suitably designed antenna and this is what is so this is your tx antenna this is your rx antenna so basically this would propagate and reach the receiver now this is uh, typically uh, we are looking at uh, frequencies uh, anywhere in the uh, in the 300 megahertz range to 3000 megahertz this is typically the uh, range that we are talking about where we would we would be dealing with the rf type of communications radio we call it radio frequencies so 3000 megahertz this is the same as 3 gigahertz so this is the same as 3 gigahertz and typically uh, cellular operations Cellular operations uh, are in the close to 1 gigahertz to 2.3 gigahertz. This is where we are currently seeing most of our uh, cellular activities. So in this range, uh, we talk about electromagnetic radiation where it could propagate in free space. It has the following uh, uh, characteristics. It, it can propagate. Uh, propagate in free space so you do not need to have a, a, a guided uh, uh, environment it can propagate in free space it will undergo the following it can undergo reflection if you have a smooth surface you can get reflection just like you would have reflection of light you could have a reflection of uh, radio waves in the in this frequency band you could also have diffraction like optical you can you can see the uh, radio waves bending around objects so even though you do not have line of sight between uh, transmitter and receiver so basically it would be something like this if i had a transmitter here a transmit antenna a, a receive antenna a receive antenna and i have a obstruction in the middle so there is a there is a building so what we will find is that there is a potential bending of the radio waves which which can then uh, which can then reach the receiver though, even though a direct line of sight is not present <clears throat> so reflection diffraction are are possible for the uh, radio waves that we are we are talking about and there is uh, another important element there is a significant loss of signal strength significant loss of uh, signal strength if you encounter objects that are metallic or which are like walls and other things so so uh, significant loss of uh, signal strength due to obstructions due to uh, walls metal 
objects. So these are some of the characteristics of the radio frequencies that we are talking about. Uh, is this Does this belong to electromagnetic radiation? Yes. Is this the only uh, electromagnetic radiation that we have? No. There are other forms of electromagnetic radiation, lower in frequency as well as higher in frequency. So therefore, uh, I, I would then say that uh, if, I, if you tell me not to use electromagnetic radiation, uh, then uh, I'm really uh, in a bind for uh, how, how do I communicate? Because uh, you know whether it is light or uh, whether it is, uh, the, uh, all, almost all of our uh, communications uh, use electromagnetic radiation in one form or the other. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if this uh, answer has fully uh, explained the uh, various elements. Uh, if there are more questions uh, or any ongoing questions, you know, clarifications of this, uh, please do uh, indicate it on the on the discussion uh, discussion group. Okay, so uh, these are the two questions that have uh, that have come in on the uh, on, on the on the spreadsheet. Now uh, let us see if there are uh, students online and if there are any uh, questions that will come in even as we are uh, speaking. So the, the two uh, questions uh, that we have answered so far, one is with respect to MATLAB. Uh, I've just kind of indicated what are some of the things that you could do. So uh, you could get a good understanding of what uh, what wireless communications is and the impairments. And uh, we can also look at the performance of uh, wireless communication systems in MATLAB. The second uh, dimension uh, or the question was that uh, uh, we, we would ask the question, can I use, uh, can I avoid the use of electromagnetic radiation? Um, uh, maybe the question you are intending to ask is, uh, can I avoid the RF uh, range of frequencies? The answer is very much yes, you could do optical. We could do optical fiber based uh, communication. Nowadays, they're talking about uh, free space optics, optical communication. So which means that uh, even LEDs uh, and uh, as just like we have uh, Wi-Fi, uh, they are now talking about Li-Fi, uh, uh, short range communications using LED uh, modulation of LEDs. So uh, some very interesting things are emerging. Uh, definitely uh, th things that uh, uh, which would not uh, typically fall under in the frequency range of one to three gigahertz. Uh, we are looking at uh, typically uh, uh, other frequencies where uh, you would have uh, 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 very good uh, characteristics as well. Okay, any any questions uh, on the chat? We, we are uh, available to answer your questions. Uh, if there are any questions on the uh, on the lectures that we have uh, discussed this week, uh, in currently we are uh, this week we are uh, reviewing lectures twenty four through twenty eight. Um, lecture number twenty four. I'll just uh, uh, highlight some of the uh, key uh, aspects. Lecture number 24, uh, we have we were looking at the moment generating function. This was a tool that we used to compute the, the bit error rate. So basically, the moment generating function is a an, uh, analytical tool for us. Uh, it helps us uh, characterize the uh, the PDF and therefore uh, enables us to work with the uh, the computation of BER. And also introduced the uh, basic elements of the wide sense stationary uncorrelated scattering. Wide sense stationary and uncorrelated scattering. The second uh, dimension, uncorrelated scattering model, is what we have been uh, looking at uh, in the, in the uh, in, in fact all of the lectures uh, have been related to the WSS US model. Uh, lecture number twenty five. Lecture number twenty five. Uh, we continued our discussion of Whiteson stationary uncorrelated scattering model. Uh, we introduced the notions of coherence time. Coherence time. And this is a very important concept because uh, this tells us what is the time variation that you will that your received signal will experience. Now, uh, if you remember, uh, we did uh, we did uh, introduce this uh, concept of time variation in the uh, uh, very first in the early lectures. So let me just uh, see if I can uh, pull up. Uh, a slide which tells us how sub substantial are the variations that can be in terms of the, uh, the, the, the time variations. So 
when does uh, when does time variation occur if i move from point a to point b so uh, let us say that uh, i start at one one point and i move in a particular direction uh, you know uh, and you will see that the uh, the rate of variation is is present so uh, this is this is a, a very important element this is what we um, we have we have, we have uh, uh, studied in the class so coherence time says uh, for how long can we assume that the channel is at least reasonably stationary so that means not changing so coherence time tells us uh, what is the uh, duration uh, for which the channel can be uh, treated as constant so uh, this is the same as saying what is the duration for which the channel can be treated as almost constant is almost why almost because it it can change but as long as it changes the changes is small with respect to the uh, transmitted signal then we can assume that this is good so almost constant okay um, lecture number 25 that that was lecture number 25 then lecture number 26 Uh, we looked at the effects of doppler now the uh, when does the channel change when there is mo motion how fast does it change depends on how fast we are uh, the motion is happening so doppler directly is related to the uh, time variations time variations in the channel that was characterized uh, we looked at the uh, doppler spectrum we looked at how the time variation occurs so uh, basically uh, understanding of how fast the channel is varying so doppler spectrum gives us uh, a good good insight into the rate of variation of the channel but as i mentioned the doppler values are small compared to the carrier frequency so you just keep that in mind uh, typical dopplers that we would we would encounter is of the order of uh, of of the order of 50 to 100 or 50 to 200 hertz Hey, remember that our channel bandwidths are in the order of kilohertz, and our carrier frequencies are in the one uh, uh, to two, one to three gigahertz range. Then uh, lecture number twenty-seven. Lecture number twenty-seven. Uh, we looked at the characteristics of time dispersion. Not only time variation, but time dispersion. So, if I transmit a signal, uh, it one copy of it. So, if uh, the 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 visualization says that if I transmit one pulse, this is the this is on the transmit side. Then, what is uh, what 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 does this happen at the uh, on the receive side? Is that it uh, presents itself as multiple pulses. So, there could be a pulse now, a second pulse, a third pulse that kind of overlaps. and then maybe a fourth pulse so these are all the copies that are coming so this is time dispersion so uh, that is also a characteristic of the uh, wireless channels that we work with so time dispersion was also considered and based on this uh, in lecture 28 we uh, looked at whether uh, a, a, a channel can be uh, considered as time varying time varying and if it is time varying is it slow or fast okay and uh, uh, whether the uh, whether this channel can be uh, considered to be uh, uh, based on the dispersion whether it can be treated as a flat channel flat fading channel or as a frequency selective fading channel will all frequencies be transmitted with the same gain or with different gains that's the frequency selective versus frequency uh, flat so uh, basically uh, uh, we looked at these uh, these elements in the, in the class uh, in the, in the lectures so uh, if there are uh, any questions on these also feel free to post them either uh, on the live uh, q and a session or you could do it on the uh, on the discussion group as well the tas i know have been answering uh, uh, several of your questions um the uh, comment from ramesh sundar uh, if you are giving detailed answer for assignments it will be helpful to clear doubts so uh, we are posting uh, uh, oh okay 
only the final answers are being posted okay so uh, it's a very valid uh, question uh, maybe the the uh, uh, useful uh, thing would be is uh, for many of the questions the answers are probably uh, easy or very obvious for those where you see that there is a doubt please post it on the discussion forum we will give you an explanation or maybe given give more uh, a, a, you know useful tips on how to solve it maybe some additional uh, quest, uh, you know related uh, calculations also we can we can provide so yes definitely we will do that uh, since many of them are direct application of what we cover in the lecture uh, we will not uh, give detailed explanation but wherever there is a need please do post it we will we will uh, provide that uh, next comment uh, from Nilanjan. Uh, if we could get the solutions to the assignments, okay. Uh, again, the answers uh, we we can provide, but uh, detailed explanations uh, we will. Uh, if you could just tell us for which ones you need, uh, we will be happy to. Uh, yes. And the next question also from Ramesh Sundar. Kindly uh, share the uh, solutions for all the assignments. Um, um, uh, again, uh, depending on which ones questions you need the details, we'll be happy to answer that. Okay, uh, uh, next comment question from Srinjoy Chakraborty. Uh, what are the emerging areas uh, in DSP needed for 5G and industry 4.0? So uh, let me answer the, uh, so the question is uh, DSP for uh, 5G. Okay, here are some uh, some uh, elements. Uh, I, again, this is a this is a topic that has got uh, it's fairly vast. Uh, but one thing that uh, they are still looking at is the transmit waveforms. Okay, we have OFDM. They are looking at alternatives for OFDM, basically for uh, applications such as IoT and other things. So there is some discussion. Uh, DSP uh, for in, in the context of, of waveforms. The uh, next big area that uh, uh, I believe is uh, in, in the context of 5G where DSP is going to be heavily involved is in massive MIMO. Large number of antennas, uh, how will we process them? How will we uh, apply them? Uh, and what sort of uh, processing we do at the transmitter? What sort of processing we do at the receiver? Now, uh, very interesting that uh, at the transmitter also, there is a lot of DSP uh, related uh, work for MIMO. Basically, uh, when you have MIMO, there is uh, actually beam forming that is that is that needs to be happening now uh, there is uh, there is analog beam forming and digital beam forming digital beam forming analog beam forming these are both are present and actually what uh, everyone feels is that it will be a hybrid between digital and analog now uh, Anytime you have a, a transmitter and there is a, a power amplifier, there are uh, digital pre-distortion techniques, basically to compensate for distortions. So that is also a DSP-based function. So pre-distortion, pre-distortion um, is a uh, channel. Then the the whole uh, I, I, the whole aspects of channel modeling, channel modeling now you may wonder you know uh, we already have 2g 3g 4g have we not figured out all of the channel modeling that is uh, uh, that that is present the answer is uh, we are now starting to look at uh, the elements of the uh, vertical dimensions as well so uh, basically uh, they are talking about something called the full dimension mimo fd mimo which also see basically we were looking at coverage as a uh, xy horizontal plane uh, problem but now they are uh, looking at the, uh, the the vertical dimension as well so for example if you had a, a building and you had different floors you could you could actually treat each of these floors as independent cells though they are physically in the same geographical location and that is because of the vertical mimo that we can introduce so these can be treated as uh, independent cells or independent regions uh, independent regions now how do we model these things how do we model the uh, the the 
the fact that this vertical MIMO uh, is also coming into play. So th th the whole idea of channel modeling is a, is a, is a very important one. Now, we also understand that uh, one of the uh, key features of 5G, uh, which we uh, talked about, was uh, network densification. Network densification, which means that there is a higher probability of interference. So basically, this means more interference in the network. Interference. Interference will increase. So what does the DSP have to do? DSP-based interference mitigation. Interference uh, mitigation. OK. And uh, not only that, uh, if you want to actually uh, mitigate interference, uh, you would also need to do very good channel estimation. Uh, channel estimation. Then uh, once you do channel estimation, as the channel varies, you will also do channel tracking. All of these are DSP functions, channel, uh, channel tracking. OK, so you can see that uh, whether it's a transmitter, receiver, uh, whether it's looking at the uh, uh, the channel modeling, uh, of course, uh, we, one big area will be in uh, in the uh, equalization. The, if there is channel dispersion, how do we compensate for uh, the uh, dispersion? Um, you know, are you going to do uh, OFDM type where you can do a, a single tap equalizer, or are you going to have a, a single carrier modulation where you can look at uh, frequency domain equalization and other things? So various forms of equalization are also present. So yes, uh, lots of very interesting areas. Uh, if there are specific questions, uh, please uh, drop me an email. I'll be happy to answer that. OK, uh, next question uh, is, in OFDM, each carrier is digitally modulated using QPSK or QAM. Then uh, why we say that it is OFDM? OK, let me see if I can answer that uh, question. So OFDM uh, basically can be viewed as a system where we have a set of orthogonal carriers. Now, orthogonal does not mean non-overlapping. It basically means that uh, you can uh, recover the signals without any um, interference between each other. So basically, we have these as the carriers. Now, previously, when we had uh, OF, uh, when we had GSM, we had a 200 kilohertz carrier, and then another 200 kilohertz carrier, maybe with some spacing. And we, we transmitted information on those. Now, what we are saying is each of these will carry a, a QPSK symbol or a QAM symbol. So basically, there is symbol S1 on this, symbol S2, S3, S4. Now, in GSM, when we had two separate carriers, they were being generated by two different receivers or two different transmitters. So they were not in any way uh, any way related to each other. They were basically orthogonal because they were separated in frequency. Now, the reason we call this as OFDM is because a single transmitter is handling all of these. This is coming from a single transmitter, where the transmitter is maintaining orthogonality between the different carriers. And that is why we call it as OFDM. Now, uh, if it was uh, just different carry, different uh, transmitters maintaining orthogonality, we would call it as FDM, frequency division multiplexing. Basically, you 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 generate your signal uh, and don't worry about the other. Some some other transmitter is generating. Whereas here, a single transmitter is is generating all of the carriers, and therefore we call it as OFDM. So uh, the name orthogonal is because the transmitter, by virtue of how the uh, how the spacing between the carriers is being maintained, uh, that is what uh, ensures orthogonality, and that is why uh, we call it as OFDM. OK, uh, the uh, next question from Ramesh Sundar. Uh, millimeter waves, are they harmful? Now, uh, good news is that millimeter waves, uh, which I'm assuming you're talking about uh, frequencies in the uh, 26 gigahertz, 30 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz range. Those are all the uh, much higher frequencies. They, they, uh, they propagate very, very short distances. Um, typically uh, of maybe a few meters at most. So uh, even if there is a source of millimeter uh, waves, 
uh, it's it, the the propagation it does not carry very far. Uh, having said that, um, one of the uh, one of the uh, things that we must be aware about uh, any type of radiation is how close is the radiation to the uh, to human tissue. So uh, again, if you take reasonable precautions, I would say uh, millimeter waves are not something that we're going to be uh, worried about because we're not going to be carrying around any millimeter wave source uh, very close to our body. So uh, uh, mostly uh, we will be looking at uh, uh, devices which will will which can use millimeter waves, uh, but hopefully through uh, through uh, hands-free mode or using uh, 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 basically a mode of operation where the radiation source is not very close and also being careful about the levels at which these transmissions will occur so uh, again um, uh, the whole uh, study of millimeter waves will look into any aspects of radiation but just like we what is our understanding about what is the effects of radiation in the current cell phones is that uh, you have to be careful uh, when you have uh, high power radiations which are uh, very close to human tissue uh, uh, and most cell phones, the way they are designed and the way they are uh, intended for use are not in the range where the ex extent of exposure or the duration of exposure is, is of harmful nature. Okay. Uh, uh, this next comment, I think, has already uh, come in. Uh, 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 mention the particular assignment you need. The ex oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Assignments two and three, uh, the request is for um, any explanations. I would say, can you please be uh, more specific and uh, post uh, a few uh, specific questions, or we can try to put down uh, some uh, minimal explanation for each of the answers, wherever we think that is necessary. OK, uh, the next question, how data rate is calculated in different multiplexing schemes like CDMA, TDMA, uh, FDMA. So uh, here is here is uh, a, a way. I think we have looked at uh, the following aspects: how to calculate. Uh, let us take, for example, TDMA. In TDMA, we have eight time slots: time slot number zero, time slot number one, time slot number seven, and then it repeats itself. So time slot 0, time slot 1, and so on. So uh, what, we will, uh, what we will do for calculating the uh, data rate in a TDMA system is that we will now go in and look at what does a single time slot look like. I'm sure you will remember a figure like this, where you will go in and see what portions of the uh, of the transmission is uh, use, useful data. So for example, in GSM, there is uh, user data in two locations. And then we uh, know that some of the other, other uh, portions are what we would call as overhead. So this is overhead here. There is overhead here. Those do not contribute to the user data. Right? So from the total uh, data being transmitted, you obtain the useful useful data number of bits okay and the uh, that is the first step that you do then you look at what is the time duration okay within this time duration how much uh, data you have been able to send and then how many users are supported in this case the number of users number of users. So basically, data rate per user multiplied by the number of users will be the way to go. So uh, data rate per user. This is something that you would have to calculate. And then multiplied by the number of users. Okay, And you know what is the resources that you have used for this. So this has been, this much of information has been transmitted using the following amount of bandwidth. That is what you would have to do. Now, uh, in the case of uh, FDMA, FDMA, what you have is individual carriers. So what you would have to do is uh, you would have to calculate the, this would be rate one, whatever you are transmitting on this carrier, this would be rate two. And then what you would do, you would be to add up all of the rates. Rate I. So basically, you sum up number of uh, 
1 to n, however many carriers you have, what is the rate that you are able to achieve on each of those. So that, that would be uh, for a, a CDMA system, uh, for a FDMA system. CDMA system, very similar to the TDMA system, except that the, uh, the way we calculate the data rate per user is a little bit uh, uh, different uh, you, because we have spreading also into, into, into play. Uh, we are not talking about the spread information. We are talking about the uh, the the, the narrowband, uh, the user information. So we have to be a little bit careful with that. But uh, CDMA systems also would follow the same pattern. What is the data rate per user? How many users are being supported in a given bandwidth? And then that will tell you what is the throughput. OK. Uh, then the uh, question is, uh, OK, uh, the feedback is, uh, uh, it's difficult to answer, understand how answer is arrived to some problems. Yes, uh, we will post uh, explanations for, uh, the, for those. Uh, next question from uh, Nilanjan. Getting the solutions of the assignments will help us recover from our mistakes, mainly from regard to numerical problems. Yeah, I think we agree uh, that TAs will be, an, uh, but more importantly, if you feel that, uh, if you find that you have made a mistake on a particular question, uh, uh, please feel free to, uh, once the uh, deadline is passed, you can always uh, d discuss with us. Um, uh, we can always clarify. Even before the deadline is over, uh, you know, you can't tell us is it a, which is A or B or C. We don't ask, we don't tell you the choice, but any doubts in the calculation, you know, how do I calculate this or can you explain this? Please feel free to do that. Uh, we will answer those questions on the discussion forum. Okay, the whole idea is that uh, you don't have to try it in a blind fashion. Uh, if you feel like there is a, a, a doubt or a conceptual uh, clarity is needed, uh, please post the doubt even before the deadline of a particular assignment. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, can you please clarify the uh, concepts of a rake receiver? Uh, there is a section on CDMA. Uh, uh, again, uh, we'll have to see how much time uh, we will we are actually be able to devote to that. Um, maybe I'll answer this question uh, um, subsequently. Uh, what we would what we would indicate is uh, the material that we will cover in our course will be more of a foundational level uh, maybe what i can do is point you to some other good resources where you can get additional information on rake receivers uh, uh, of definitely uh, the uh, coverage that is given in proecus uh, is is very good um, uh, again if if you have access to digital communications by proecus i would say that that's a good point but there are other nptel courses we we will try to locate them. Uh, I will request the TAs to um, uh, lo locate and then pass it on to you. Good. Uh, let's move on. Uh, the next question. Uh, can we know the research areas at present for 5G and uh, what is the areas to concentrate on? So uh, in, in 5G, there are, uh, there are uh, several, as we discussed, there are several areas that are being looked at. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, any of those are useful. Uh, since we already talked about the uh, DSP based, let me now look at applications. A vast number of applications are emerging in 5G. So, uh, in within the within the uh, cellular system, there is a tech, uh, there is a mode called narrow band IoT. You could study that because that that tells us how uh, the cellular systems could be used for. Uh, different types of uh, uh, applications. So what are some of the applications that uh, that, that people are looking at? Uh, uh, smart city. What are the types of communications you will need? Meter reading, uh, you know, lighting, parking, so many things uh, are being discussed. Uh, intelligent transportation, where there is congestion, real time uh, information, all of this being uh, transportation. Then comes the communications needed for electric vehicles. How much charge is present? Where, where can you get your next charge? So basically, the whole strategy of electric vehicles. Um, another uh, very big area, very important area that where their communications is going to play a very important role is in the smart grid area. How can you, uh, if you are generating electrical power, how do you feed it to the grid? How do you get credit for it? Uh, uh, you know, how do you buy power at the lowest price uh, in real time? All of that is happening here. So, uh, if, and uh, there is uh, there is the smart home initiative. 
so there is smart home where uh, you could communication between appliances uh, then you could have smart buildings and I, I think the uh, list is actually very, very long. So basically, I'll put a dot, dot, dot. And so all of these are uh, emerging areas. Now, if you uh, look at uh, within the cellular context itself, there are some very interesting areas. The first one that I would like to point out is uh, cellular plus Wi-Fi in integration. So uh, how can we have a very good cooperation between cellular and Wi-Fi? So you have cellular. It's got a large coverage. You have Wi-Fi, small coverage. Now, if a user goes from uh, a outdoor region to an indoor region where you're within the coverage of Wi-Fi, how do you have seamless mobility? So that is that is one type. There is another area of research that is happening that is in the area of handover. <clears throat> and why is this challenging? Because we now have 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G potentially in the future. So you could be handing off from one 4G to another 4G within the 4G network. Or you could be handing off between 4G to 3G or 4G to 2G. And of course, uh, and so basically the whole area of handovers has become much more complicated now because you must now handle very diverse uh, types of, uh, of channels. The uh, another uh, very big area that is coming in the context of 5G is called carrier aggregation carrier aggregation what does that mean uh, typically uh, in a uh, receiver i have a receive antenna i have a band pass filter so basically only a select band is passed through i will have a low noise amplifier and then i will have a down conversion RF to baseband, and then I will have all of my baseband processing. Baseband processing. Okay, now this is ideally suited if your transmitted signal happens to be in a particular frequency band and you're able to convert it down to baseband. And, and process it. This is this is the process. But now, if your so your frequency allocation is given to be uh, so it is one contiguous band. Now, when they talk about five G, they are saying that the, the frequency allocation for you could be uh, one megahertz here, ten megahertz elsewhere in a different frequency band, a tw another twenty megahertz. So they are discontinuous frequency bands. OK, now, how do you combine all of them or translate all of them into contiguous bands so that you get all of these as contiguous pieces of information, which you can then uh, process? Now, this is highly challenging because uh, th this, this is something that where you, you do not know where the uh, ahead of time where the band is. So in, uh, in, in a very dynamic fashion, you would have to, you would have to program your receiver or you have to, uh, your receiver would have to adapt to be able to accommodate that. Now, in addition to all of this, uh, 5G will introduce uh, new modes of MIMO. We call it as massive MIMO. How will we handle the uh, uh, these areas? Uh, uh, very, very important. So basically, we are talking about a large number of antennas. And we are talking about uh, high data rates. So let us look at uh, the power consumption issue. Power consumption of these uh, devices will be much higher because we have high data rate. This will imply that our A to D is operating, A to D is uh, analog to digital converter, is operating at a very high rate. At high rate, and anytime A to D runs at very fast, they, they will consume more power. Uh, consume more power. Okay, each A to D is consuming more power. 
Now, if you say that I have many antennas which I want to uh, digitize and then process, that means each antenna requires A to D. So the whole area of power consumption uh, and how do we have uh, low power? How do you achieve low power? Huge challenge. Low power. So, uh, you know, so th there are uh, uh, many, many areas. You can look at it application. You can look at it in terms of transport. You know, how do I combine cellular and Wi-Fi? Or within cellular, you can look at whether, how do I do handover? How do I do carrier aggregation? How do I look at uh, massive MIMO? What do I do for power consumption? You know, there are uh, many, many interesting areas. Uh, there are some uh, good tutorial articles on 5G. Uh, maybe I, I will make a note and ask the TAs to post uh, some a few tutorial articles. And those who are interested, uh, we will, uh, at least we'll give you a link uh, on the discussion forum. You can look it up. And then if there are more questions, we'll be happy to answer them. OK, uh, next question from uh, Harsh Sethi. Uh, when, you, uh, when you sum up the course, will you please spare some time to give directions of research in this area, 4G, 5G? Uh, today, what we have done is uh, just touched upon a, a few topics. Maybe towards the end of the course, uh, maybe the last session that we have, like uh, interactive session, maybe I can take a special lecture on, on 5G itself and then give you some indications on how to, uh, what are some of the good uh, topics to study further. Okay, uh, can you also suggest a good simulator for wireless channel? Can we simulate vertical handoff in wireless wireless LAN UMTS network with the help of MATLAB? Um, now that's a very good question. Let me see if I can answer it in the in the following way. So uh, l let me title this as uh, simulations. Now simulations are of are of different uh, different types. We have what we call as the physical layer simulations. Physical layer has the following elements. It it talks about what channel coding you have used, uh, what we have used, okay, what modulation we have used, uh, what is the um, uh, channel impairments. Uh, channel impairments, and then what are the uh, receiver uh, algorithms, algorithms, equalization, synchronization, all of that. And uh, then also we have the channel decoding. Now, this is all uh, channel decoding. Now, this is all uh, part of the physical layer. Okay. So uh, when we talk about uh, physical layer, it is about two devices. Let's recall them as A and B. And whatever communication happens between them in the form of uh, the bits that are being communicated. Now, here comes a very, very important question or aspect. Now, what happens if B starts to move? Okay, so then what ha what happens is uh, initially A was communicating. Okay, maybe let me let's draw it in the, in the following manner. A A communicates to one tower. Okay, so uh, basically there's a link to one tower, and this one communicates to another tower. Let's just quickly capture uh, this information so that, OK, I, this is a transmitter. So I communicate to one base station. That communicates uh, via the core network to another base station. And at the other end, I have this user, who's this is user B, who is communicating here. OK, so what does physical air capture? It captures. It, it does not worry about uh, the, uh, the the base stations and which base station is connected to you. It just says there is a wireless channel in between A and B, and that is the physical layer. Okay. Now, what happens if uh, user B starts to move? At some point, there will be another tower to which user B will then communicate, and so this link will now be broken and the the communication now has to happen between these two okay and the the, the uh, this link is not the one that will work anymore 
that will be the link that will work. Now, can you see that as far as the physical layer is concerned, it does nothing has changed. It's just that it happened to come through another base station. On the other hand, something did happen as far as the network was concerned. You were connected to base station uh, B1, but now you got connected to base station B2. Now, this process is what we call as a handoff process. Now, uh, a, a simulation like MATLAB uh, cannot uh, is not in, designed to have this type of a feature where you have to have signaling and handoff and others. So physical layer type of uh, simulations, I would say the best tool that we have, a very useful tool, would be MATLAB. But on the other hand, uh, of course, in MATLAB, people have built uh, higher level simulators also where you can uh, simulate uh, aspects of handoff and other things. But probably what would be best suited is a network simulator, NS3, which would then be able to simulate not only the physical layer, but the aspects of the higher layers, higher layers. OK, so this, this could then look at connectivity, handoffs, and other, other aspects. So uh, I would say that uh, MATLAB, very useful for physical layer. Uh, probably there are some features that could be uh, implemented in MATLAB, but uh, there are other simulators which are uh, suited or well designed for that. And also uh, some uh, other proprietary software to tools are also available in order for us to be able to do uh, system level simulation. So physical layer simulations and network level simulation. So there are two different types. Uh, different tools are probably useful for those. OK, uh, uh, Salman has asked a question for final exam. Do we need to remember all the formulas? Uh, will the exam be online or offline? OK, uh, good question. The uh, exam will be online and it will be, uh, yeah. So uh, you you, it, it, you will be assigned to a center where you will be uh, go will you will have to go and then uh, write the exam at a, a computer center. So it will be an online exam, and uh, we will uh, then uh, give you the uh, additional details of what information you will need. But it will be uh, primarily the uh, the pattern will be very similar to what you have been having in the ex in the assignments. So uh, you would not have to uh, d derive or uh, long formulas. A lot of it will be conceptual. Uh, if something needs to be remembered, let's say a Q function, uh, you need to have the uh, the value of a Q function. Those will be given to you. You don't need to be uh, no need to uh, remember them or try to uh, 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 to uh, calculate that. OK, uh, another question. Uh, uh, reliability of the cellular network and uh, related topics. Uh, reliability is a, is a crucial uh, topic. Uh, it is something that reliability. Now, uh, from a, a course point of view, so this is not covered in our course covered in our course. And let me tell you why uh, that it is not covered in the course. Reliability has a lot to do with the implementation. Implementation. Okay. And uh, it, this, this also uh, has to do with how many cells, what is your uh, density, uh, how, how do you uh, deal with handoffs, uh, what is your uh, link ma uh, margins that you have uh, provided? Link margin that you have provided in your uh, system design. So like this, there is a lot of uh, uh, factors. Now, each of these have got a uh, direct uh, bearing on how reliably a system will perform. So uh, uh, th these are things that we have touched upon. Uh, for example, you know, we have talked about cellular design, uh, you know, how many users can you support in a given cell, uh, things like Erlang capacity. 
but at the end of the day uh, when we have to link it to reliability it is not a, each parameter does not have a direct correlation uh, there would be uh, interdependency so it's a fairly complex field and it is something that uh, we as uh, people who are in the academic area may not be able to understand or you know explain it fully uh, the people who can explain it will be network operators themselves because they do uh, very detailed system planning they do traffic planning uh, they do traffic shaping they do a lot of things which are happening in real time there's a lot of intelligence in the network so uh, all, all of that together uh, will will be uh, how a system becomes reliable so uh, again it's a fairly complex topic the aspects that affect reliability we have studied in the course but reliability itself is a uh, operator uh, uh, operator optimized uh, parameter and that is something that uh, i believe we will not be able to do justice to that it would be best to uh, have an operator handle that okay uh, next question sir can we go for 5g in gsm band itself using mimo uh, uh, very good question uh, let me just uh, answer this question in this way gsm is uh, this is 2g and it is operating in the following bands 900 uh, megahertz band uh, it is in the 1800 megahertz band and in the 1900 megahertz band okay now uh, if you look at gsm today uh, in the 900 900 megahertz band if there is 20 megahertz of spectrum we have given it to four operators operator a b c and d each of them with 5 megahertz 5 megahertz okay now if operator a wants to convert uh, the, the, the this spectrum to 5g okay operator a b c d want to stay with 2g operator a wants to convert to upgrade to 5g now or or to 4g for that matter Okay, now what the operator A can operate, uh, can use is only the, the spectrum that is available to him, what, whatever he owns the spectrum. Now, but 4G has got a mode where you can use 20 megahertz. And in 5G, they expect that you will be able to go up to 100 megahertz mode. Now, those modes are not possible because I, the operator does not have that spectrum. So can uh, a 4g system be deployed in, in in existing 2g bands yes uh, but you you may be constrained by what bandwidth you have available now if you had the option of taking the spectrum away from all the four operators a b and a b c and d and then re-auctioning it that is called spectral refarming okay spectral refarming is something that the government has the option of doing saying that 4G is more spectrally efficient uh, rather than having four different operators. Uh, let's we, we'll uh, you know auction it as one 20 megahertz uh, band. Now, uh, will that happen? When will it happen? How will it happen? We don't know. So uh, at this point, uh, operators will probably look for spectrum, new spectrum, where they can deploy 20 megahertz or 100 megahertz system because that is what are the features that are coming up. Uh, existing 2G bands are they are very constrained in terms of the bandwidth that is uh, that is available to them. Okay, uh, uh, let's then. Uh, uh, can you share the slides of session one, two, and three, or uh, of Hangout of the course portal? Whatever is the live Q and A session? Yes, I think we should be able to uh, uh, share with you the slides. Um, uh, the suggestion is. Uh, please offer on antenna and radar okay we have experts in antennas and radar uh, i'll definitely pass on the uh, inputs to them okay uh, another question uh, i am doing research in gsm spectrum efficiency i found that 60 to 70% spectrum is used in some dense areas can this uh, frequency be used for 5g i think we just answered uh, pertaining to that uh, when you say 60 to 70 percent of the spectrum is being utilized uh, i'm assuming you, you mean the following so if i look at it on a uh, uh, space time grid okay so uh, this is this is frequency so i have a particular band 
let us say uh, I have a five megahertz band, five megahertz band, and I have several cells where uh, this portions of the spectrum are being used. Okay, so uh, they are geographically separated. So let me call this uh, some uh, spectrum S1. S1 is being used here, here, uh, here. Uh, so many, many cells are using the same spectrum. And so when I look at the uh, all these uh, the the places where spectrum S1 is being used, uh, S1 is not being used 100%. That, that is correct. Because when will it be used 100%? That means if the uh, cell is fully loaded, that means it has reached its capacity. Now, it could happen that uh, this one is at full capacity. But some other cell may not be at, maybe this could be at half capacity. So very, very rarely will any spectrum in a cellular system get loaded to 100% all the time. So uh, especially if you look at uh, what happens during nighttime or during rush hour traffic, it's very different. So yes, uh, your estimate that uh, these uh, GSM bands are being utilized around 60 to 70 percent uh, is correct. Uh, but it has to be qualified by saying over what region are you looking at? Are you looking at a metro? Uh, you know how, how you are you, uh, describing the occupancy. So. But the fact is, uh, this 60 to 70 percent is used, uh, even though uh, utilization is 60 to 70 percent, but the end, the uh, spectrum is used at some time of the day. So which means that since it is it is something that is used, it is, it's not like the spectrum is not used at all. Uh, it's not like uh, 70 percent of you know, if, I, if I look at S1 is the band, uh, it is not that you know this portion is used, this portion is unused. No, that doesn't happen. So, uh, so this whole thing is uh, whole thing is S1. So, uh, what happens is when I look at S1 as a whole, uh, it is used uh, part of the time, not used part of the time. So, because it is used by for some part of the time, I cannot take it away. I cannot say, okay, no longer GSM. I'm going to do something else with it because it unless you can show that it is zero utilization. Unless uh, so, uh, the 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 uh, the, the the challenge going forward will be is to maximize the utilization of the uh, of the spectrum. So that is a, a ongoing topic of research. Uh, there's a, a, a area called cognitive radio, which is trying to address the, the utilization factor. If there is some portion of spectrum which is not fully utilized, can we introduce additional methods uh, for utilizing the technique uh, the the spectrum more effectively? But right now. Cellular bands, uh, we would see somewhere between uh, 40 to 70 percent utilization. Uh, it will not touch 100 percent because there are times in the night or certain geographical regions where the cell is not fully loaded because not many users are there. So therefore, uh, what you will find is that uh, the utilization uh, will be will be high, but not close to 100 percent. OK. Uh, uh, next question, uh, can you explain the concept of timing and uh, frequency synchronization? Okay, uh, let me give you a very simple uh, explanation. First, let's address uh, frequency synchronization. Synchronization. For this, we would have to look at what happens on the transmit side, what happens on the receive side. So on the transmit side, I will have a baseband spectrum, which has to be translated up to a radio frequency and will produce for you a modulated signal, which has this shape. So this is carrier frequency FC. Now at the receiver, I must uh, down convert back to baseband. But I do not have the exact reference FC, but I have FC plus delta. Then what happens when I shift it down, my spectrum will now be not at, uh, at zero, but it will be off center. It could be to the left or up, depending upon the value of, of delta. OK, so uh, this is the problem. 
this is frequency synchronization and this could cause uh, other impairments into your constellation and this has to be corrected so the first step that uh, we need to do is make sure that you produce a signal that is centered exactly the way it was so this is what we refer to as the uh, uh, synchroni uh, as the frequency synchronization okay second uh, element so uh, i hope the frequency synchronization part is uh, is clarified i must have the signal at baseband exactly as it was in the transmitter a any offsets uh, even if it is off by a few hertz uh, will cause uh, what is called constellation rotation so this constellation a four point constellation will not remain uh, fixed if what it will happen is it will start rotating Okay, this will start rotating and this will start rotating so uh, and you will start making errors so uh, this has to be uh, adjusted otherwise there will be a problem next uh, element is timing synchronization timing synchronization now uh, there are two aspects of timing synchronization there's something called coarse synchronization and fine synchronization i'll explain both of those using the gsm slot structure now, in the GSM slot structure, uh, there is a mid-amble, a training sequence that is present, and, and, and there are some guard bits and flag bits. So, so there is a flag bit on either side, and then there, there are guard bits. So now, I want to I want to detect the first symbol. I must know which sample I should take. By mistake, if I if I take instead of taking this sample, this will correspond to uh, symbol number one. But uh, if I if I if I slip and I by mistake have taken a different uh, sample, then this this will not be symbol number one. It will be some other. Uh, this is actually overhead information. It is not even data, user data. So I, I'll actually uh, get the wrong data, and therefore I will make a uh, lot of errors. Um, so. This is a this is this aspect of knowing exactly where my data begins and ends. That is coarse synchronization. So this red one can be thought of as coarse synchronization. I must know around the place where the data is beginning. Now here comes the next element. So if I look at the pulse that was transmitted, I'll just give you a illustrative example. Let's say these are the pulses that are being transmitted. And this is the for each symbol that needs to be transmitted. So the pulse. Now notice that if you pick the sampling point exactly at this point, you will be able to pick up the full value of the signal that you are interested in and uh, not pick up any unwanted signals, the green or the purple or any of the other ones. So. Uh, on the other hand, if you had picked up a sampling point, uh, let us say, which was here, then you will find that you're picking up the red all right, but you're also picking up part of the green. That is undesirable. So always, in your based on your pulse shaping scheme, there will be an ideal sampling point. Ideal sampling point. Ideal sampling point can be defined as the one that produces or gives you the maximum signal to noise ratio. It is also the point that will ensure that there will be minimum intersymbol interference. Because if there is intersymbol interference, it will it will reduce your uh, effective uh, signal to noise ratio. Okay, so. Uh, Basically, if you want to find that point that gives you the best uh, or the highest probability of correct detection. So which do I choose? This Now you're, you already know where the symbol is. You know where the red is. Now do I sample the uh, symbol here, 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 here? Where do I, where, which, one, which of these samples do I pick up? That is fine synchronization. So timing synchronization, where I want to know where my uh, data is beginning, that is coarse. Within the symbol, which sample should I take? That is fine synchronization. Okay, so I hope uh, this would uh, clarify the need for synchronization and also the method of uh, synchronization. Next question, how can efficient code be generated in CDMA? 
and what are the limitations or any upper bound on the process of generation okay uh, i'm assuming i'm making an assumption here that you are talking about in cdma an essential requirement is the spreading codes spreading codes now uh, if 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 you uh, say that you want to do a spreading factor of 64 you can find 64 walsh hadamard codes you can have walsh hadamard codes there are 64 codes available codes available 64 walsh hadamard codes of length 64 now the uh, problem is that if you use all 64 the amount of interference that you will get within the cell will be too large so therefore, uh, even using the 64 codes that are uh, available, these wall shadowmat codes, these 64 codes are fully or perfectly orthogonal to each other. OK, now, if for some reason you are interested in generating more than 64, uh, the reason I'm pointing out is uh, even 64 codes using a spreading factor of 64, it's hard to use all 64 codes. However, if you are interested uh, to generate more codes, you can generate what are called quasi orthogonal codes. Okay, so which means that it will be a code that which is not perfectly orthogonal, but has very good, uh, uh, very close to orthogonal properties. And there are a large family of quasi orthogonal codes. So one is uh, you may have enough spreading codes in your uh, orthogonal set. If that is not sufficient, you can always extend it to a quasi orthogonal set and therefore uh, be able to um, uh, generate more codes than you would need. Um, next question. Uh, can you please tell us uh, who the primary uh, and secondary user in GSM and cognitive radio in GSM? OK, uh, maybe a quick answer to this one. Now, cognitive radio, here are the definitions. The primary user is the one who owns the spectrum is the spectrum owner okay the secondary user the secondary user is the spectrum borrower is the spectrum borrower so you borrow from the owner and give it back to the owner okay whenever the owner demands it now, with this uh, definition uh, in place, uh, in GSM, who's the primary user? The operator. Operator is the primary user. Operator is the primary user. Who's the secondary user? Secondary user? No one. Not allowed. Operator owns the spectrum. They will not allow anybody else to borrow the spectrum. Even if they are not using it, they will not give it to anybody else. So in cellular bands, there is no secondary user. There's only primary users. On the other hand, there are unlicensed bands and other bands where uh, you know cognitive radio may be permitted. Now, those places where they, you will have uh, a primary user and a secondary user. Okay, Somebody owns the license, but the owner is willing to uh, allow primary users. Now, there may be other uh, bands where there is no primary owner. OK, the, those are the like the unlicensed bands. Anybody can transmit. So an example of a case where there will be a primary owner, but the primary owner may be willing to allow you to use is TV white space. The uh, spectrum is owned to a TV station, but the TV station may not be transmitting. They may, may have switched over to satellite or to cable. So in which case their spectrum is idle. So then the TV owner may say, uh, TV spectrum owner may say, yes, secondary usage is permitted. So under this condition, they can have a primary user and secondary user. But um, as far as we, we understand, uh, op cellular operators will not uh, permit uh, secondary usage. And that is not part of their uh, licensing agreement as, uh, either. OK. Uh, Next question, uh, uh, what are the ways to mitigate intersymbol interference? Uh, that's a good question. Intersymbol interference, the primary way is through an equalizer. Now, equalizers, there are many different methods. Okay, So uh, there are what we call the linear equalizers. 
where you try to invert the channel. Then there are uh, different types of nonlinear equalizers, uh, which would be uh, different types of. Um, so uh, what I would say is, uh, let me just uh, indicate what are the methods of equalization. The simplest is what you would call a zero forcing equalizer. You apply it through a filter that tries to undo the channel. Second is uh, you try to have some form of decision feedback equalization. So uh, you do not try to force a zero completely, but you, you use some of your past decisions in your uh, probably the uh, most widely used and uh, which is uh, used for equalization uh, is called the maximum likelihood sequence estimation. Maximum likelihood sequence estimation. There is a very popular name that is given to this. It is called the Viterbi algorithm. This is also called the Viterbi algorithm. This is probably the most widely used uh, equalization technique for uh, many of the uh, wi com com wireless communication systems. Uh, there is also another method which is used primarily when we want to have iterative uh, uh, techniques. That is the ma uh, maximum a, a posteriority probability uh, uh, equal uh, equalization techniques. So uh, basically, uh, I would say that most of the equalizers that are used today uh, fall into one of these uh, four categories. There may be some variations. You know, it may be adaptive, non-adaptive. It could be uh, so different types of adaptation possible. But by and large, uh, I would say that these are the broad categories of uh, equalizers. OK, uh, we have uh, answered all of the questions that were posted on the um, on, on the chat. Uh, the NPTEL, uh, uh, the op operators will, uh, uh, will, will post whatever notes we have written down today on, on uh, will, will be, we'll give it to us, and then we'll post it on the, on the, on the network. OK, uh, one more question has come in. Uh, the deep space network, uh, how it works, uh, I may have to do some referencing on that. Uh, but I will definitely um, look it up. And maybe in the next session, we, we will address it. But maybe just one point to note is uh, the deep space network is probably the network that has got the uh, maximum antenna gain in any of our uh, terrestrial systems. Um, and it, it's a very, very powerful uh, antenna uh, system uh, which can pick up very faint signals from uh, distant points in space. So uh, I'll be happy to give you a little bit more details on it uh, in terms of the, uh, and I know that the antenna gain that they achieve, there are three dishes. Each of them achieves an antenna gain of about 70 dB, 70 dB. It's unthinkable that we can achieve such levels. Uh, but we are told that the Chinese are building uh, 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 a space um, antenna, which is actually more powerful than the uh, deep space network. So maybe I, I, I'll give you uh, details of both the deep space network and the Chinese network. Uh, I believe the Chinese network, the um, space system is called I in the sky, I, I on the sky. So you know, very interesting that they are actually building something. They are building in the crater of a volcano. So basically, it's a uh, it's such a huge network that you cannot you cannot support it in a man-made structure. They are actually building the reflectors on in a, in a mountain crater. Okay, so very interesting. So let me uh, share that information in the next session. Uh, until then, let me sign off. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll uh, keep posting any doubts or questions. Uh, we will try to answer them. Um, if there are some things that uh, are not directly related to the course, uh, please uh, email them to me uh, per, uh, directly to my mail ID, and uh, I'll be happy to uh, respond. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week.